What's going on everyone, it's Justin here, and today let's talk about some iPhone. So it's been a few months since we talked about that. We did review the iPhone 11 Pro, and I feel like for like the past few months, up until the Samsung announcement this week, there hasn't been that many smartphones that have come out. And usually Apple's a company that likes to release phones in the second half of the year, but this year, we expect to see another model slotted in at around March. So the lower priced iPhones have always been some of Apple's most successful, from the iPhone 5C to the budget $399 SE, to the 10R at 749 and the lower price of the iPhone 11 at 699, Apple is once again set to release a budget version of their phone which could possibly be the most exciting Apple product for this year. Continuing a trend of Apple finally listening to their customers that kind of started in a new wave in 2019. In fact, for the past few years, the model of iPhone that I've been recommending to the most amount of people is actually the cheaper model. The iPhone XR was a very good device for its price. It had pretty much all the main features and specs of the flagship iPhone at a much more reasonable price. And in the iPhone 11 year, this made it an even more compelling recommendation because of the addition of the secondary camera, which is the wide one, on the cheaper iPhone that was reduced in price from the XR. The LCD display compared to OLED is really something that a lot of people don't really care about, including myself. And honestly, the only reason why I personally use the iPhone 11 Pro is because I like to have a large screen because I watch pretty much all videos on my smartphone and just having the third camera is sometimes nice to use but I would be totally fine using an iPhone 11 as a daily. But for reference, my iPhone 11 Pro costed over $2,000 in Canada, which is just ridiculous for a phone. And if I wasn't using it every single day for work in the tech and mobile industry, I simply would not need anything close to that. So for starters, this phone is likely to be called the iPhone SE 2 or the iPhone 9. So drop a comment down below as to which you think it will be named, and also subscribe as I'll probably be giving a few away. I personally think it's going to be called the iPhone 9 because it just seems a little bit weird to call it the SE 2. So the previous iPhone SE model was released in March of 2016 and looking back it was definitely one of my favorite phones at the time because of the incredible value and small form factor that many still loved and weren't really ready to leave just yet. It also had the updated specs of the current generation at the time. The current phone in Apple's lineup that is most comparable is the iPhone 8 from 2017 which is currently available on Apple's site of $449 and the iPhone 9 is said to come in at a price of $399 while giving you superior specs some of which borrowed from the current flagship line. So if you want like an updated phone and don't care for the newest exterior display features like an OLED screen that wraps around, this might be the product that you're really waiting for because being a fraction of the price of the new 11s and with the A13 processor expected to be used, the update would obviously allow for iOS 13 compatibility and also continuous updates for many years to come and just have like a nice fast phone at a really good price. So this may be a ploy to people who are still using later generation iPhones and devices that are not capable of running the newest software and taking advantage of Apple's services that they've been really trying to sell over the past few years. Because as you guys might know, Apple is all about ecosystem when it comes to the iPad, the MacBook, and the iPhone. It's very much a closed off system, but on the physical side of things, the budget iPhone is going to resemble the size of the iPhone 8. It will give you a home button with Touch ID sensor and likely a lack of Face ID, although there has been some speculation. It's also been predicted by a trusted analyst Ming-Chi Kuo that the starting spec will be 64 gigs for this iPhone. And when it comes to rumored colors, you're not going to get like the whole pastel or colorful lineup on the iPhone 11 and 10R, but instead you're going to find a white as well as a dark black or gray, and also possibly a red as well, and you're expected to see a kind of matte finish or frosted glass that we find on the iPhone 11 and 11 Pro. Some of the case manufacturers have already opened up some pre-orders showing designs that look pretty much the same as the iPhone 8, but the credibility is kind of to be questioned. It might just be sort of like a marketing or press thing. So when it comes to the full list of specs, we're expecting to see an A13 processor as well as IP68 water resistant rating, which is the same on the iPhone 11, as well as wireless charging, which was present on the 8 for the first time, as well as three gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage with the option of 128 as well. And when it comes to the display, there's a bit of a toss up between a 4.7 inch screen, which is the same size as the iPhone 8, or potentially a slightly larger one of 4.9 inches, which would just stretch out to the edge a little bit more. On the camera side of things, we expect to see a 12 megapixel sensor, but what type of 12 megapixel camera, that is still to be questioned. Whether it's gonna be the same one as the iPhone XR or the one on the iPhone 11, I feel like at the price of 399, expecting the same camera as the iPhone 11 Pro as well as the 11 is gonna be a bit of a stretch, but I hope they do it, and if they do, with the same processor that you're gonna find on the iPhone 11 Pro, it's gonna be an extremely competitive device to its own lineup. Last but not least, in terms of battery and thickness, this phone is expected to be 1700 milliamp hours in size. And when it comes to thickness, we expect it to come in at 7.8 millimeters, which is 0.5 millimeters thicker than the iPhone 8. 
With the newest lineup of iPhone 11 and 11 Pro, it seems like Apple is finally over trying to make the thinnest products as we also saw in the MacBook 16 and instead giving you a better battery life and performance. So I think with March inching forward, we will likely keep getting some more information about this product because it's definitely changed in a few directions. We expected to see a squared off device, but for now it seems like it could be a very strong candidate if you need an incremental upgrade and are not picky about utilizing the display features or face ID or also like a multiple camera because I know a lot of people just don't need that at all and just need one solid camera and updated specs. One thing that could be a barrier for Apple is production and manufacturing. With the coronavirus over in China and the recent announcement of MWC getting cancelled, Foxconn being at a very low production volume right now, there has been rumors that the next generation iPhone is already in production, but the March release at around mid-March for Apple's first product event could be in question. There's definitely a lot of hot competition in premium phones nowadays, but sales were relatively stagnant in 2018. And in the last quarter of 2019, Apple did finally see a bit of growth after consecutive quarters of declines in the smartphone sector. The iPhone 11 and the iPhone XR are predicted to be Apple's top selling devices over the past few years, so a device like this at $399 is going to help a lot, especially with the growth that they will see in the Indian and Asian market, which is an area where very solid phones are popular at much lower price points than the $1000 and up phones that you're seeing from like Samsung and Apple. As I mentioned before, Apple has also been pushing into the services business with news, card, music, arcade, and also TV+. And by offering an accessible device as a gateway into the ecosystem, it can really complement the growth into Apple's services business as well. An area that has a higher profit margin at 64.4% as reported by Macworld. This is compared to a 34.2% margin on overall Apple products in the last quarter and 53% on the iPhone SE when it was released in 2017. So we do expect to see the margins relatively similar in this particular sector. Another thing to keep an eye on is Apple entering the folding phone business in the future. And this is unknown if it could happen in the short term or long term or even happen at all, but Apple had recently filed patents to aim to minimize the creasing of the display to maximize durability of a very complex type of device, one that Samsung and Huawei have already tried. Samsung's been doing a good job and heading the right direction with the recent announcement of the Z Flip, but other companies that are new to it, like Motorola, have done less of a good job. But with Apple owning 80,000 patents in total and more counting every day, these folding phone rumors are far from confirmed, but it does seem like they're definitely experimenting, but with the number of patents that are filed by tech companies every single day, I wouldn't say you want to get your hopes up too high anytime soon. But otherwise, this is pretty much a video giving you like a roundup of the newest rumors and information of the new iPhone 9 that is expected to come at a price of $399, which I think is the most exciting thing because it is overall just going to be a win for consumers. You've got better specs, you're probably going to get a better camera, maybe a larger display, but at a lower price of the previous generation phone that Apple is currently selling. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I'll see you all in the next one.